welcome to the main stage here at Tech Connect Live. There are seats, so if you're standing at the back and you want to join us, you are most welcome. We're not going to bite you or ask you to join in or anything like that, so do sit down. Um, because over the next 30 minutes, we're going to have a very interesting discussion that's looking at the future of connectivity. And that's quite a broad uh, statement, and it's quite a broad look ahead, because it could mean connectivity in terms of me, the consumer, you guys, the business people, or all of us as you know, citizens of the world. Um, but you all have extensive careers, and we've heard quite a bit in the last half hour um, about where it's going in terms of payments. But Chav, if I could start with you, could you perhaps give us a bit of an overview of where we are right now in terms of connectivity and how that's changed over the last decade alone? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so connectivity is really at the core of our society at the moment. So it's, uh, if I wanted to compare to something, is, is more like the plot system of our uh, society. And we don't often think about this when we use our phones and applications. But um, if actually you took connectivity away, you would uh, essentially block everything that is happening you know, in business, in education in, uh, and in any area of our society. So um, like, uh, just to make a comparison, like you might know uh, from whatever, from Web, or maybe you are a medical doctor, that we have about 160 kilometers of uh, blood vessels in our body. And 160,000 kilometers, which is like four times the circumference of the Earth. So, how, how can all of that, you know, uh, all of that stuff be in our two meter tall body? And, and this is very similar to the, the, the connectivity and, and network infrastructure that is carrying all our communications today. Like it's almost invisible, but it's essentially a huge infrastructure in terms of uh, uh, devices, optical fiber, and uh, human resources, the people who are running all of those, the thousands of people who are running all of those networks and equipment. So uh, connectivity has become really the, the, the blood uh, stream of, of our uh, society. Now, where are we with, with uh, all of this today? So uh, th there are so many different trends uh, in, in, um, in uh, connectivity and in communications today. Um, there is a huge push for uh, bringing uh, online everybody everywhere so that you can uh, complete your tasks and work from anywhere, bringing on uh, uh, the digital workplace and allowing people to work fle flexibly to balance their work uh, time with their uh, private time and uh, increase their uh, life quality. Then uh, there is also a strong push towards wireless technologies. So. Uh, if I just uh, look at Vodafone, uh, a couple of months ago, uh, we trialed the first 5G uh, network here in Ireland, and we demonstrated 15 gigabits per second speeds. So uh, the, the connectivity is, is uh, you know, speeding up both on, on fiber, both on uh, and on, um, on on wireless. Uh, the latencies are, are are dropping, which enables uh, new um, applications. Um, business critical applications, safety critical applications, and it allows us to scale up and connect more and more devices, even billions of devices, to, um, to our networks uh, through uh, Internet of Things and uh, improve our society in many new ways. So I would stop at that. At the moment. Yeah, no, yeah. because you've touched upon pretty much everything that we're going to explore over the next few minutes. Because you mentioned 5G technology, which is going to change everything again. Um, because we, it's taken us a, lot, a long time to get to where we are now. And Claire, we're going to come to you about uh, smart buildings. But before I do that, I want to come to you, Colm, because we just heard in your presentation there about um, the, the payment side of technology, because that's an industry that's seen massive change in recent years. You know, very often when we picture banking, you picture men in suits in grey buildings and not much innovation going on, just cash going from one to the other. There can be a delay, but we as consumers are quite impatient. So give us just, and I know you've just finished your presentation, but give us a brief overview about the evolution of the payments tech. I, I, in some ways, the, the is that working? Yeah. 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 yeah sorry. In, in some ways, the um, the underlying technology hasn't really changed that much, right? Um, 
we were recently um, implementing um, direct debiting, say, on our service, which is a feature that we'd all be familiar with. And um, I remember doing that 30-something years ago, I think. <laughs> or no, not quite, but it was, it was certainly more than 25 years ago. And nothing had changed. In terms of the underlying infrastructure within the cars network and within the clearing system, nothing has really changed. Yeah. There's been very little innovation in that. The, obviously, the CEPA and the, you know, the arrival of the single currency within the European context was a huge development, and that did bring huge benefits for people. Um, despite what the Italians might want to do shortly, but it, nonetheless, it, it worked. <laughs> we won't right? talk about that just no. now. <laughs> um, so it, what's really changed at the, at the, at the, in payments is the way in which you access the service. And Stripe is a great example of, of giving you access to a service that up until that point could have been clunky and could have been complicated. Mm -hmm. But underneath it all, the transactions, believe it or not, are still going through the same networks using the same standards that were put in place a long time ago. Yeah. So what's really changing is the is the, the, the outer layer is changing and the way in which you access the payment service is changing. The way in which you might, for example, get into the future in the UK, they're working on the concept of the request to pay so that every bank will have with embedded with its, its, its application the idea that you can actually send somebody a request and that they can respond to that request and pay you. So the idea being that you, you, you don't reply to people and you don't, there's a huge problem at the moment with these um, the authorised push payments, they're called, which is fraud. So people are getting these invoices, and then down the bottom of the invoice, it looks like it came from some credible supplier that you're using, but down the bottom, there's a, an account number, which is a fraudster's account number, but they've made this invoice look just like a regular invoice that you would get, and it's a mega, mega problem right now in the business industry. And trying to get rid of that, we're seeing the people talking about the request to pay functionality. So mm -hmm. I think you'll see, and the other one is the confirmation of payee is a concept in the UK where you'll be able to type in a source code and account number and it will turn for you the name on that account so that you'll be able to verify that it is the person that you're paying. But all of that is kind of like sticking plaster in a way because it, it yeah. doesn't fix the core issue, which is, that, which is that like, you know, when you want to pay somebody, you don't necessarily want to share your account numbers. And when you want to pay somebody like by card, you don't necessarily want to give them your card number, mm -hmm. right? So th those fundamental problems still exist today. But what's really interesting, as you said there, is still the fundamental service is just being packaged in a different yes. way and we're getting access and the whole process, I suppose, is happening much quicker and instantaneous yeah. than it would have been even five years ago. But Claire, I want to bring you in here now because what you do intrigues me and your, your entire area. So when we think of technology, we often think of phones and we think of TVs and to a certain extent, banking. But you talk about buildings and the internet of things and buildings. Yes. So uh, explain, where do you come <laughs> in and where, where are we going in terms of the buildings of the future? Yeah, okay, thank you. So in terms of buildings, people think there's no data in a building, but there's actually a lot of data in a building. The problem is that it's not connected, okay? That it's in a silo, that it sits in a bucket, it's proprietary, it's closed. You think about a, um, a BMS system, a building management system that controls all the lights and the HVAC systems, heating and ventilation, uh, air conditioning systems. They're closed and proprietary. What clients actually want and what users of buildings actually want is some control over their environment. And this is really pushing the envelope, pushing the building. So now if I am a, uh, a corporate and I want to lease a building, I want, I'm kind of thinking now, well, I want a building that makes my employees more productive. Okay? So it's coming from a completely different end of the spectrum to where buildings were normally delivered. Mm -hmm. So normally somebody would say, I'm going to build a building. If they get a fancy architect, the architect goes, I want to build this building and win an award and so they build a fancy building and make it beautiful and then the poor old person who has to operate the building the facility manager says I, I want to win this building but I've got to put my price really low so that I can win it and commoditize it and this fancy building that the architect won an award for looks beautiful but actually costs a fortune to run okay because it's got a beautiful atrium and in the SLA I have to clean the atrium make it clean I've got to get a cherry picker in all these problems okay yeah. so that's traditionally <laughs> at a very high level where we are and the data in the building has been in these silos so each company has their own silo of data and excuse the the phrase here but it hasn't been democratized now the people who and and it's been pushed as well the 
the industry say by the younger generation, want to come to a really cool building. And employees want to retain talent and they want to have a building that makes their employees more productive. So you can't forget the uh, underlying um, running of that building. You've got to make sure that building is running well. But how do you add in this wow factor? And this is where the IoT is coming in. This is where traditional industries are being forced to open up their data so that we can use the data. So to get to the point, when you walk into a building, the way the, direct, the industry is going is that you're, you're empowered as a building user to set the environment to your liking, so personalize your space. So if you trace that back, if I'm a user and I want to find a free space to sit, I don't want to spend half an hour trolling around the building trying to find a free desk. I want to find a desk to sit. I want to make sure I'm not sitting in somebody else's regular space. I want the, the temperature to be how I like it and I want the lighting to be how I like it. Mm -hmm. And if you look online at what MIT are doing, even when I move, I want the lighting to change, to fit my mood. So if I'm lying back, let the lighting dim, and if I'm sitting forward, let it be bright so I'm working. So that all sounds fantastic, and that may make me more productive, and if I know the queue in the cafeteria, I won't go if it's busy. So all of that is we're using IoT devices, but we've got to pull it into one place. And in order to facilitate that, we have to understand what seating we have. We have to put under desk sensors in there. We have to no longer have a centralized air conditioning system and lighting system. We've got to have localized systems. So we've got to change the way that that is delivered. Then we've got to enable the data to be pushed into one place, into a cloud, so we can learn what is going on here, so that we can form design so then architects come in uh, and designers and we say we need a new building and the purpose of this building is as office space but I want to be able to flex it that they just don't go off in a silo and build something that looks pretty that it's actually functional that people can flex and change okay and sorry <laughs> no no but just I'm just wondering in terms of like that does sound amazing and if you are someone like you know Vodafone or Google yeah. or one of the big companies and you have the money to do that I've been into the Vodafone office in uh, Mountain View and Leopardstown and it's a gorgeous building and again they do have that where you can kind of sit where yeah. you want but is that really practical in terms of a business that has 100 employees they're willing to take any scrap of space they can get <laughs> do we need to find a happy medium between the goal and then you know human standards so so in that case it won't necessarily be um the the, the company they'll probably lease space it will be down to the people and this uh, this is where the market is opening as well who, who own that space so the real estate investment trust who own that building Okay, so the iPuts of the world. Yeah. So they, will, they are now looking at the industry and saying, if I just build buildings cheaply, okay, and, and charge a cheap rent, um, you know, that is one model I can do, but my yield's not particularly very high. Mm -hmm. If I build a smart building, uh, and I charge a little bit more, but I can show that by renting my space, actually your staff are going to be more productive. Yeah. That's a whole new different business model. It is all how you phrase it, isn't it? it once you see there's a business, um, I suppose, reward from it. And Ken, I want to bring you in here. Firstly, to find out, do you have a cool building? Do you have a connected building? You, you, you work in the innovation center, so. So you've been doing your homework, yeah. Am I on? <laughs> yeah, you're on. Yeah. Um, Okay, so yes, we do have a cool building. Um, we're at the very start of our journey right now. We've had a, I see some faces in the audience. We've had a, out as kind of guests at the moment. So if you're familiar with the old ferry terminal in Dunleary, um, lots of people would have passed through it, millions over the years, basically. Um, so we've taken over control, or we will take over control. I don't want to kind of like jinx anything at the moment. Planning is in with Dunleary County Council at the moment, but we're going to be opening up the largest um, innovation campus in the country. Um, and essentially what we're doing is we're taking the best, um, well actually just a little bit of background for where I come from. I was working as the Chief Technology Advisor in IDA for the past four years, so um, I had a really nice job um, working with all the multinationals across the state and, and attracting foreign direct investment into the country, but also cultivating the, um, uh, an ecosystem for innovation. Um, and I guess bringing that um, into a really iconic building in Ireland that sits on the water that everybody's familiar with. What we want to do is layer, I guess, take the best in terms of co-working spaces. So you see co-working spaces have taken over the world. We work with um, valued at 20 billion last year. Um, and I think every city around the world, I don't, I don't have the numbers, but it's like, it's incredible. They're and, everywhere. And they're everywhere. <laughs> yeah. But what we want to do is take the best um, practice and frameworks in co-working space, apply the best practice in innovation, 
um, and merge the two of them together and create an environment where genuine innovation can happen. So, um, and I guess what's unique about the um, Harbour Innovation Campus is it will be in a really interesting location. It's on the water. Um, second, we will be layering it. So I don't know if anybody's familiar with the Triple Helix of Innovation. Has hands up anybody that knows Triple Helix of Innovation? So it's an old theory, basically, but it's a really effective framework, and it, we've applied it in Ireland, maybe not as strategically as, as we could, but the whole idea is you get government involved, you get academia involved, and you get in industry involved, and you mix the three of them together, and that's essentially how innovation can happen. So from a government perspective, obviously, there's the financial supports, the IDA grants, the Enterprise Ireland grants, um, um, to mitigate the risk for innovation. You bring academia in, the research centers, um, and because we're talking about connectivity, I see um, BT networks are in the, uh, in the audience today, but um, you bring in kind of like the, the, uh, the research and academic um, folks as well. So in around, say, for example, IoT, mm -hmm. um, you've got Sigfox, you've got um, NBIoT, you've got LoRa, that's been rolled out by one of the research centers as well. Um, we want to have all that infrastructure under one roof or essentially in the in the campus so that companies can come in and kind of like genuinely innovate. So it's kind of like we want to create a sensor, we want to create a device, we want to make sure it works on the marine, in a smart city, in a smart building. How do we do this? Well, let's try using the dis different transmission types, see which is most effective for, for our use. Um, but also, at the same time, surround yourself by really interesting companies. So surround yourself by the corporates, well actually from everything from in enterprise, from the startups all the way to the large corporates. And, and we just want to create a machine essentially for innovation. Mm. So there won't be any company in the building that will be more than 20 people. And we're only looking for kind of like the innovation um, uh, parts of companies. There will be a thousand members in the campus as well. We'll have all those supports. So essentially what we're creating is a single roof of one building where you can walk into and you can have everything Ireland has to offer in terms of innovation, whether that's access to funding, whether that's access to the government's networks, access to, and when I mean networks, I mean the soft networks, not um, infrastructure networks, <laughs> technical networks, um, access to IP, um, shared services, yeah. lawyers, etc. And then all the, I'll say all the research centers, we're in conversation with the research centers to figure out how we can have those dotted lines at least to them, um, but universities as well. So the whole idea is, is if we bring it back to connectivity, one door, one roof, and connectivity to the entire state. Now we can't talk about connectivity and innovation and infrastructure without acknowledging that we still do have a broadband issue in this country. If you go to particular parts of the country, they are struggling to get dial up some days. I've been around the country and I've met businesses who have to drive to a Starbucks to be able to upload mm -hmm. their salaries to pay people. And that's very frustrating. Yeah. You mentioned 5G a few minutes ago. Yes. How, um, you know, when I was speaking to people in Vodafone in the past, it seems like we could have 5G connectivity around the country before we have the national broadband plan rolled out. How important, yeah, how important is that though? Because if you do go to pockets of the country, there is literally nothing. Yes, so the deployment of um, cellular uh, technologies so far has been focused on where people live. So essentially, there are two types of statistics that you can get. What percentage of a population in a country is covered by, say, 4G, or you know, when 5G comes about by 5G, or what percentage of the country's territory is covered? So, so far, the focus has been on the population. But now that 5G is coming about, this focus is shifting on the territory, because you will have connected cars, you will have drones, you will have a lot of machinery. Uh, possibly autonomous machinery that will be working in places where you don't have uh, that, that unpopulated places. Yeah. So then you need to make sure that you have coverage in, all, uh, in, in those areas as well. Uh, coverage is also important for these future uh, use cases because uh, these use cases can be safety critical. So if uh, your car, your automated car, drives out of uh, the coverage area, that can, uh, that can be a problem. So you need to make sure uh, that you are building coverage for the geographies rather than just you know, the pockets of population in the country. In, in terms of broadband, there is a continuous investment, uh, well, I'm speaking from a Vodafone perspective, uh, in, in both fixed technologies and um, 
mobile technologies. So as I uh, mentioned earlier, uh, we are on our way to deploy uh, 5G in 2020 commercially. So before that, we'll have trials here and there, but 2020 is currently the target for commercial deployment. And uh, in terms of optical fiber, you might have heard of uh, Vodafone's investment into a company called Syro, mm -hmm. that essentially is deploying fiber to the home uh, around the, the regions of Ireland. So it's essentially outside of the main urban centers where you kind of already have pretty good coverage in most places. So, so there, there, are, there is a lot of investment going on in this space because we believe, as I said earlier, connectivity is the, the, the blood of our society. You can't exist without it anymore. Yeah, Colm, did you want to jump uh, yeah, in there? Yeah, I was just going to say, I, I, I mean, I, I'm glad you brought that up in a way because I, I think the broadband um, from a rural perspective is, it's really awful. I mean, it's beyond awful. And um, I've first-hand experience of it ourselves. And um, certainly along the West Coast, and even if you look at along by the cliffs and over there, which is like, you know, I don't know, the, probably the number one attraction that we've got. And the number of tourist industries that were down there, and it was... Um, chatting to one of the restaurants, the small restaurants along the way. And we'll call him, do you think I should upgrade my broadband? Because what's happening is when I go to make a payment to my supplier, by the time I authenticate myself on the device, it times out. Yeah. And I want to go from a two megabit to a four megabit connection, and it's going to cost me an extra 30 quid a month. That's painful. And that's the challenge that this woman had, right? And I remember thinking, like, and getting really annoyed, like, that, 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 they're comp being completely excluded from that. And the other thing that we found recently is that there's a lot of people who will, because of the, the rents in Dublin at the moment as well, a lot of people who are commuting in from the Midlands, right? We've got people who are spending like two hours, two and a half hours a day getting into Dublin and then going home again in the evening, right? And for those people to work from home, like they have to have broadband as well. And they don't. Yeah. And they don't have this access. They don't have this connectivity. So I think, it's a, I think the problem's getting worse because we haven't fixed it. And, and, it, and it's still there. And you know? the, the thing that scares me about this, and the reason I brought it up, is because if we are talking about connectivity, you know, if you strip away all the technology, how do you connect with people, with yeah. your community, person-to-person yeah. -person interaction? Yeah. And there are places in this country where people live in isolation, they're completely on their own, yeah. and not only do they not have, you know, Netflix on demand, but they can't do their weekly shop online, or they can't do any of the things that we all take for granted. And my big fear is that, as the rate of technology keeps picking up and picking up, people are going to be left incredibly far behind. Yeah. And that's why I'm intrigued to hear you say that, Colin, because you are working in the mobile payment space and all of that, but you must interact with people who would love to engage more with technology but just can't because they don't have the yeah, infrastructure. Yeah, I, I get surprised by it sometimes, because and there's that age difference thing too, which you see too, where with older people, and um, I, I was talking to a neighbour recently and um, she was explaining why herself and her husband couldn't go to a certain event and I was trying to, I couldn't work out what was why they weren't going to this but it was basically because they don't have email and I remember thinking to myself, Jesus, like, you don't actually have email and it was like one of the first times I actually heard this firsthand, like the lady down in County Clare who couldn't carry out her business, yeah. so we're, we're, we are the lack of connectivity for those people it really inhibits them from getting involved You know, it really does, it holds them back and uh, Claire, to come back to you for a minute now, because if, again, if we are trying to look ahead, and obviously we know that we do have issues around the country, but there's a lot of construction going on back again here in Ireland now at the moment. Are people looking seriously at integrating technology f from the literal foundations of a new build? <laughs> yeah, they are, but there's a, there's a few uh, challenges. I say that, challenges. That people are looking at technology to be the silver bullet, and it's not. Okay, what companies need to do is look at their internal processes, look at, what they can, look at what they can change, look at how they can be more lean, look at how they can be much more productive and innovative, and then look at a technology solution that can help them do that. Okay. So rather, you can do it in parallel, but thinking that technology is a silver bullet is, is, is where it's going wrong. And if you look at the building information modeling process, that you know, I'm, I'm involved in that as well, and the UK have mandated that uh, all uh, public buildings use this process. You know, there's all these terminologies and these standards out there, and you can see the lack of understanding because a client will say, 
things like, I want BIM level two. Well, immediately you know they don't understand what that means. They've just heard it, said I, everybody else has it, I have to have it. That happened a few years ago yeah. when everyone had an app. You know, you yeah. had you know, your local green grocer developing an app just because everyone else had it. It's that yeah. piggyback thing that we it, all just jump on. Exactly. And, and the amount of times that you see, and construction companies are really looking hard you know, how they can uh, become more tech savvy, how they can digitize their processes, how they can be safer for employees, how they can deliver a, a superior product on budget and on time. Mm -hmm. They are really looking at this. <laughs> but the amount of times you go to a conference and somebody's showing the technologies that they're using and yet they flip to a photograph of guys on site with paper plans. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's like, so you've got to look at your process. So your process there that they've ignored is that we have technology, we, we do this digitally, you take the digital device, but then it comes back to, can they connect yeah. on site? You know, it, can they make the changes that they need to ch make as per the business process on site if they can't get connections? Okay, so yes, the, the industry is moving. Yes, it has a huge way to go. It is... It, a siloed industry, not more than not one company owns more than one percent of the construction around the world. Wow. So it is small companies. You've got the trades to consider along with the big guys. But people are looking, and what will come out of this is my dream: is that we will have what we call a digital twin of the building. So we will have a physical representation that accurately maps the physical actual thing and then you can make really good informed decisions and then you can sell that alongside the physical asset and then it will help people down the supply chain through the life cycle of the building to understand what went on in the past what they need to do now and what they need to do in the future and uh, we are kind of tight on time so what i want to do now is talk about privacy and chav if i can come to you here because we know yes. that last friday gdpr finally kicked in Indeed. there's no more annoying <laughs> warnings uh, around the place but as you mentioned, uh, you listed off some things that are coming down the track. So 5G, autonomous cars, yeah. healthcare will more, uh, be, become more reliant on the internet and the digital infrastructures. But how important is it that security moves hand in hand with the innovation to ensure that we don't have to you know, learn from mistakes? Yeah, so, so um, security to move together uh, with connectivity is, is absolutely important. So like, uh, I, I guess, it is really easy to explain this after all the mediatized hacks uh, that we witnessed last year. Yeah. You know, WannaCry and Petya and all the high profile cases in the, in, in the media. And uh, I believe that we essentially have to, <clears throat> have to accept that cybersecurity is a, a key part of uh, our communications. And, as such of our society. Mm -hmm. So once you accept that, then, then you can move on and you can see it as an opportunity. It can be an opportunity to grow your business because you can differentiate yourself if you uh, deal with uh, the, the, your customer's data properly and uh, you protect it, uh, then uh, you, will, uh, you will build trust and loyalty. So, uh, so we in Vodafone took GDPR really, really seriously, and we are taking uh, cybersecurity also very seriously. We have integrate, so we are integrating uh, cybersecurity in all of our core connectivity products, so that they are not like an an alien sort of um, thing. There, they are essentially part of our products. And uh, also, we have been uh, working over the last two years relentlessly to uh, get ready for uh, last week's GDPR launch. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, uh, I myself, working in product, I, I, I filled out tons of, of uh, spreadsheets. You know about how our products are using customer data, and which, from which perspective, we are a, a processor or a controller. So uh, we, we did everything we could to make sure that our customers' data is protected, because we believe that it's not only a, a duty to do, but it's also an opportunity. And Ken, if I could bring you in there just briefly, because uh, we are qu uh, quite close toward the end of our conversation. They're happy about it. Um, but from a young uh, innovator, a startup, someone looking to get uh, you know, into the industry in some way, shape, or form, do they have to instill the, the, the core values of security, privacy, respect, all the basic things that the big companies now have in their mission statement? Is that something that you can teach a startup? Yeah, I think so. Well, I guess, like, you'll hear the term security by design um, is, I don't want to say thrown around quite a lot at the moment, but it's like, um, having worked in industry and having worked in innovation and, and different areas, um, usually you follow an SCLC, a software delivery lifecycle process traditionally when you're, when you're developing um, code or whatever. 
um, and the security aspect is a box here and it'll be an attachment or it'll be a tick box. Mm -hmm. um, I think what we've seen, especially in the past few years um, from industry has been um, that idea of, of security by design. So it's like, okay, what's our product? What's our service? What do we, what do we want to do? How do we incorporate or how do we ensure that security is not just built into the product, but from the ideation? So from uh, security is, is taught as uh, part of the design and the design process from the very beginning until until the end of life of the product or service as well. So there's a kind of like this uh, security life cycle associated with the SCL life cycle as well. It's, it's, it's something that I think like GDPR has been really interesting. It's opened up a lot, a lot of conversations that happened yeah. about it. I know even in our organization, we've been kind of going like, what does it mean to us? What do we have to do? And you have to go down kind of like those dead end roads to kind of figure out, okay, well, this is what it isn't, but this is what it is. Yeah. And, and security has become a bit more um, uh, prevalent, I guess, in terms of uh, our knowledge and, and general society's knowledge. But Claire, in terms of if we're going to make buildings smart, so a company has a CEO and it has a CTO and has all these different things and they're humans that can make decisions about what's right and what's wrong. If technology is built in again to the foundation of a building, where does the privacy aspect come into that? You know, if I'm on the hop and I'm hiding in a meeting room to get out of another meeting that I don't want to go to, will the building wrap me out? Will they know where I am? That's my concern. <laughs> Not that I do that in case my boss is here. I'm very good. Go on. Yeah, so that is a massive concern, and it's a massive concern with employees. And if you have an app uh, that you are expecting your employees to use so that they can, you know, find out where the, the free meeting room is, they, the employee needs to understand that nobody's tracing and following them, and there's ways that you can do that. And GDPR is baked in from the ground roots of a lot of the, uh, the solutions that are out there. Uh, so we do protect that privacy. For example, we've worked with companies that have done uh, footfall tracking using a camera. In Germany, even though that camera doesn't download any video, we cannot use it. The German authorities will not allow us to use that in the workplace. So there is protection for employees because at the end of the day, the employee will not use the app or allow you to connect to their mobile device because it's all bring your own device if there's not value for them and if their anonymity isn't protected. Yeah. yeah and I just want to say, just coming back to this, anything that you can connect to, any IoT device, be it an under desk sensor, whatever, wherever the connectivity of that is, be cautious because that is an open door for a cyber attack. So oh, you have totally, to close yeah. all of these doors and make sure that you, they are closed. Well, that's a really nice, scary message to end on. So everybody watch your back because the tech is spying on us. Uh, but my panel, thank you so much. And if you can stick with us, we're going to take a short break. So grab a coffee, go to the loo and join us back here on the main stage later on. Thank you. Great. Thank you.